population growth. So we've seen that the Fibonacci numbers and the golden ratio can govern the growth of an organism, like a sunflower, or a population, like bees or rabbits. So we saw the Fibonacci numbers and the golden ratio playing a role in both of those um, scenarios, the organism and the population. But it's not the only rule that can govern population growth. Okay, so we're going to look at two other models that can govern the growth of a population. A population growth model. Um, okay, so a population growth model is a way to describe how a population is growing, a mathematical way to describe how it's growing. So the population could be humans or rabbits or dollars in a bank account. Right? It doesn't have to be a, a population of organisms. It can be anything. So we're going to talk about population as a sequence of numbers. So we spent a long time developing our ability to talk about sequences and the notation. So for example, I could write the population of Greenfield on January 1st of each year of the last 20 years. It would just be a list of numbers. So P0 would be the initial size of the population. P1 is the size of the population after one unit of time has passed, etc. cetera. Okay. So what we're interested in is the transition rule. How do you get from one population to the next? Okay. From one population size to the population size one unit of time later. So the Fibonacci transition rule, if you remember, was that we should um, add two numbers in the sequence to get the next. Each number was the sum of the previous two. So we're going to look at different kinds of transition rules for population growth. So for a linear growth model, which is the kind that we're studying today, which is just one kind of model, right? we've already seen that the Fibonacci numbers can govern population growth. So Fibonacci, we could call it Fibonacci growth is one kind. Another kind is linear growth. In this case, the population grows or shrinks by the same amount at each transition. Okay, so the sequence that results from linear growth is called an arithmetic sequence. And we talked about arithmetic sequences in our intro to sequences lecture. So you need two pieces of information for a linear growth model. You need the starting amount. You have to know how much you start with. And then you have to know how much the popul population grows each unit of time at each transition. So for example, we have um, a nuclear reactor. It has a 100 ton tank for storing high level radioactive waste. It currently has 35 tons of waste in the tank and the reactor generates five tons of waste per year. Okay, so if I want to write a recursive and an explicit rule for P sub n. So P sub n Let's do the recursive rule first. So how do I calculate the amount of waste in any given year? Close. Plus 5, yeah. So you take the, the amount of waste you had in the year before, which would be P sub n minus 1, and add 5 tons to it, right? Because it says that we generate five tons every year. So what I also need to put for a recursive rule is my starting amount, 35. P sub zero is my initial amount, the first number in the list, 35. And then for explicit, I'm going to start with 35 and add 5 tons every year. So I'm going to start with 35 and I add 5 tons every year for n years. So what do I add? 5n. Yeah. So I start with 35 tons and I add 5 times however many years have passed. So here's my explicit and my recursive. So 
So it might help, instead of trying to jump right to the formulas, if we had made a little table, right? Because that's how we first learned how to write formulas. So let's do that. I should have done that first. So if I have n, p sub n, I should have done this. If I had 0, year 0, I have 35 tons in the tank. Year 1, how many tons are in the tank? 40, because I add 5 every year. Year 2, 45. Year 3, 50, etc. Right? And then this might help me write my recursive and my explicit formulas. I would say, oh, right, adding 5 at each turn. So each p sub n is the, the p sub n minus 1, the, the term right before it, plus 5. And then I also need to tell you, and p sub 0, the first number in the list, 35. So I've changed my notation just a little bit. I'm calling the first number in the list p sub 0 instead of p sub 1. So we were always called the first number in the list p1 before. Now I'm calling it p0 because it represents the initial amount, not the amount after one year of accumulation, but how much you start with. So, um, so that's just a small adjustment to make. And then here to write my explicit formula, I would say, okay, well, I'm starting with 35, and I'm adding 5 every year for n years, which would be 5n. So the 5 in this problem um, is called the common difference, right? This 5 that I add to get from year to year called the common difference because, and we call it the common difference because when you subtract successive years, 40 minus 35, 45 minus 40, the difference between any two successive populations is 5. So that's why we call it the common difference. The difference between the populations in any two successive years. And in some cases, we're given different, inform different starting information. Instead of being given P0 and the growth rule, you might just be given P3 and P6. If you know it grows linearly, see if you can find an explicit and a recursive formula for this one. All right, so my hint was to make a table, n and P sub n. And we do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I know P3 is 28 and P6 is 40. So I'm going to try to use that info to fill in all the rest of the numbers in the list, all the rest of the PNs. So look at what I know. P3 is 28 and P6 is 40. So to get from P3 to P6, how much did we add to get from 28 to 40? 12. So I added 12 to get from 28 to 40. And I moved 1, 2, 3 years. I had three transitions, right? From P3 to P4, 4 to 5, and 5 to 6. So I'm looking for a number that when I add it three times, I get 12. So what number, when you add it together three times, do you get 12? 4. So if I add 4, 28 plus 4 gives me 32. 32 plus 4 gives me 36. And 36 plus 4 gives me 40. So my transition rule must be plus 4. In order for P3 to be 28 and P6 to be 40, it has to be that you add 4 every time. So I add 4 to go forward in the list. To go backward in the list, I would subtract 4. So I'm going to have 24, 20, 16. So now I've got my full list of numbers, and I want to write recursive and explicit formulas. So let's start with recursive. So P sub n. How could I write that in terms of the number before it? Yep, the number before it is p sub n minus 1, and what do I do to it? 
to get p sub n add four good and i also should tell if i was explaining the rule to somebody i would say each number in the list is the number before it plus four and you'd also have to give the first number in the list right in order for them to be able to apply the rule you need at least one number to start with and then if i wanted to write an explicit rule how would i do that so I'd say, well, you start with 16 and you add 4 over and over again, right? And repeatedly adding 4 is the same as multiplication, 4 n times. So we've got recursive and explicit. You okay with that? So you don't need to memorize the formulas for linear growth because we just did it twice in two different problems. We found recursive and explicit formulas for linear growth just by thinking through what linear growth means. But here are the formulas, right? If you want to have formulas to refer to, you can put them on your cheat sheet for the test. A recursive formula for linear growth would be P0 is the start amount. You've got to give how much you start with. And then you would say P sub n, the population in any year n, is P sub n minus 1, which is the population from the year before, plus the common difference, that amount that you add to get from year to year. And for explicit, you say, well, P sub n is the starting amount plus n times the common difference. Right? So you add the common difference n times. So again, you don't, no need to memorize it because we can solve these without having the formulas in our heads, but sometimes formulas are helpful. Not always yearly. It could be daily. It's just a common, I should say, per unit of time. Okay. Yeah. All right, so here's an example. We have a manufacturer currently has on hand 387 widgets. Okay, during the next two years, the manufacturer is going to be increasing his inventory by 37 widgets per week. Okay, so assume that there are exactly 52 weeks in a year. How many widgets will the manufacturer have after 20 weeks? All right, how'd you come up with that? 37 times 20, right? Because 37 is how many he's producing per week for 20 weeks, right? And you're going to add whatever that amount is to the amount he already has, 387. Okay, and that comes out to, say it again, 1,127 widgets after 20 weeks. How many widgets will he have after N weeks? Yeah, so in this case, we're going to take, say, 37 per week times n weeks, right, plus the 387 he already has. That looks like 3.7. Okay. Which kind of rule is this, recursive or explicit? Explicit. And if I was going to write any, a recursive rule, how would I do that? Sure. Does it matter which order it goes in? I mean, no. seven, seven, or vice versa? Yes. The order of the addition doesn't matter because you can add numbers in any order. A plus B is the same as B plus A. Um, mm-hmm. So the number of widgets we have in week n is equal to the number of widgets we had the week before plus 37 more, right? We had 37 every week. And I also need to note how many we started with. W0 is 387. Okay, and this is our recursive rule. Yeah, you should always give the starting point so that somebody can actually use the rule. Right? You can't use the rule unless you have some number to start with. 
how many weeks until the manufacturer has 720 widgets? I'm going to give you a couple minutes to think about it. Okay. Can I help you? Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how many weeks until the manufacturer has 720 widgets? Nine, okay. You already have 387, oh, right? Eight, so it's just you already have 387. Yeah, yeah, so we say, okay, we already have, if we already have 387, then we take 720, Subtract the 387 we already have, and you get 333. Uh, right. We'll do it that way, too. We'll do it that way, too. Right. So, so we have 333 that we need to make, right? Right, because we already had 387. We have to make 333 more. We can make them at a rate of 37 per week. So if we do 333 divided by 37, we get nine weeks. It'll take nine weeks to bring the inventory to 720. So this is sort of a way to just reason it out. So when you're writing that out as a formula, uh -huh. that's how it's right. Still put the sub n. Yep. So we put p sub n is equal to 387 plus 37n, right? And I'm looking for n, right? I want to know how many weeks, and n is representing numbers of weeks, until my population, p sub n, is 720. So replace the p sub n with 720, and I want to solve for n. So this is just a more algebraic way of coming up with the same answer. Yep. And so you do the exact same steps that we did when we just reasoned it through. Subtract 387 from both sides. That's your 720 minus 387. Then divide both sides by 37. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You want, it's not that, like, thing, but... yeah. <laughs> 333 equals 37n, and we get n equals 9. So that is the power of algebra, right? Once you have an established equation, you can follow just a set of steps and make sure it'll, you'll come out with the right answer. It's sort of the, the power and the drawback of algebra. The power is that we can find the answer without actually having to think, right? That's also the drawback because it's, 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 you often can fall back on the rules and not use your common sense, right? <clears throat> So one other way that we could have gotten this uh, nine weeks would be if we used a table, right? So we did it here just based on the verbal description. We reasoned out that it would have to take nine weeks. Then we did it algebraically. We could also just use a table. I could do n, p sub n, and start at zero and go to nine. So I'd have 387, and then I'd say week one, I'd add 37 to that, 424. What, what's this one plus 461 and I'd and it would turn out that in nine I get 720 just another way of getting there it takes longer yeah yeah so each each method has its own strengths and weaknesses you can do whichever one you want um, if I had asked you when does the population reach you know a million the table method would not be a good method, right? It would take you forever, right? So the table method is great. Um, it's not as powerful as one of the other two. <clears throat> However, if I had asked you, when does the population reach 424, you probably wouldn't need to do a table. You could just in your head say, oh, well, that's 37 more one week. 
So in a linear growth model, just remember the definition is that you always add the same amount at each transition. Okay, so from year to year or week to week or day to day, whatever units of time we're using, you're always adding the same amount. So let's say that the same widget manufacturer, who already has 387 widgets and can make 37 per week, he wants to build up his inventory. Okay? So rather than putting all these midget, widgets out on the market, um, he's going to store them. He's going to put them in storage, trying to build up his inventory for two years. Okay? He's just putting everything in storage for two years. And it costs $10 per week to store a widget. Um, and he plans to store all of his widgets for the next two years. How much is he going to spend on storage? So why don't I let you think about it for a few minutes before we discuss. How much would he spend on storage? Remember, he doesn't have to store all of the widgets for two years. How many is he going to be storing for two years? Oh, not the 387 that he's already got. No, those he, he has to store those. Oh, I thought yeah. <laughs> no, he's storing everything he has and everything he will make. It's just going to go into storage. So 387 widgets have to be stored for two years. Those are the only widgets that have to be stored for the full two years, right? Every set of widgets he makes is going to be stored a week, less. a week less. Yeah. So think about how we could figure out how much he's going to spend on storage. 387 widgets, so maybe the units might help here, widgets times 10 weeks, um, sorry, $10 per week, $10 per week times 104 weeks, and that should come out to 387 times 10 times 104. $402,480. So just those 387 widgets that he has to store for a full two years is going to cost $402,480. Now he's also going to manufacture 37 new widgets per week. So in the first week of his manufacturing, he's going to make 37 widgets. They get stored at $10 per week for how many weeks? 103 weeks, right? One week less than the, all the remaining widgets, all the widgets that he started with. They have to be stored for the full two years. But he doesn't have these 37 until a week later, a week into his two years, which means that they only have to be stored for 103 weeks, one week shy of two years. <clears throat> and then the next 37 widgets that he makes the week after that, they also get stored at $10 per week, but how long do they have to be stored for? 102 weeks, because they didn't get produced until we were two weeks into the two-year time span. So that means that there's only 102 weeks left in the set of two years. And there's, there's a reason I'm not um, multiplying these out. You'll see later. Okay, and then we're going to make 37 more times $10 per week times 101 weeks. Because they didn't get produced until three weeks into the two years, so they only have to be stored for 101. My last set of widgets, how long will they be stored for? One week. So each of these, I could rewrite as 370 times 103, 370 times 102, 370 times 101, 370 times 1. 
So I need to add these all up, right? Because this is how much I'm spending on each new set of widgets. So I have to add these all. So do we have a trick for adding a long list of numbers? We talked about it a ways back. Um, write out the sum going forwards. Right. Yeah, that's the formula that we came up with. But I'm going to remind you how that formula um, came to be. So add up our numbers going forwards. So let's see, I'm going to have 370 times 103 plus 370 times 102, three, seven, um, that's probably enough, 370 times 2 plus 370 times 1 has to equal some amount that we don't know, so we'll call it x. Okay, then I'm going to take my same list of things that I'm adding together and write it out backwards. Okay, so I'm going to have 370 times 1 plus 370 times 2 plus 370 times 102 plus 370 times 103 also equals x. When you add forwards and backwards, you should get the same sum. And then our trick is to add these two equations together. So 370 times 103 plus 370 times 1, that's 370 times 104. Right? I have 103 370s plus one more 370 is 104 370s. And here I have 102 370s plus two more 370s is 104 370s. So these all end up being 104 times 370, and that equals x plus x, which is 2x. Okay, so including everything that I didn't write down in the dot, dot, dots, I just flipped it. Sorry, you can do multiplication in either order. Sorry, I, I should have kept it consistent. Okay. Um, so including all the numbers that I didn't write here that are in this included in this dot, 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 how many things am I adding up here? I've got one, two, three, four, plus a bunch that I didn't write in this dot, dot, dot. Close, 103. So because I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, blah, 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 102, 103. So I have 103 terms in there. So if I add up the same number 103 times, that's like multiplication. You do 103 times 104, 370s. That equals 2x. So I have this number, 103 of these. And then I just solve this number for x, multiply it all out. So I have 103 times 104, what? Each term in this list is? Yeah. Yes times 370, and then I'm going to divide both sides by 2, and I get x is 1,981,000, 1,981,000, um, I already divided it by 2. Yeah. So that's how much the um, manufacturer has to pay to store his new widgets. You have to add that to how much he was paying to store the original 387. 
Yeah, so we have to add this $402,480. Okay, so this is for new widgets. So my total is old plus new, right? So it was 400, 402,480 to store the old ones that he had already created, plus a million dollars, 981,720 to store all the new ones that he's going to create over two years. And that comes out to a total of... Two thirty eight four two zero zero. So that's two million three hundred eighty four thousand two hundred dollars to store all of his widgets. So he's probably much better off sending them right out to the market, right? Not having to pay for storage. And this is actually a really common um, problem that manufacturers and business people contend with is minimizing how much inventory you have in storage because okay, it costs money to store things so it's a it's a delicate balance you want to make sure you have on hand the things your customers want to buy right if you own the warehouse yeah then you can then you don't have a all you have is the maintenance of the warehouse it doesn't matter how much stuff you put in it um, yeah, but you want to balance making sure you have the things on hand that people want to buy with not having too much on hand because storing things costs a lot of money. So the arithmetic sum formula, this is our little shortcut for calculating um, adding up a long list of numbers. Okay, If you're trying to add a long list of numbers that happen to form an arithmetic sequence, right? that means to get from one number to the next, you're always adding the same amount. You just add the first term and the last term. I thought that was linear. It's the same thing. Okay. Yep, linear and arithmetic are synonyms. So you add the first term and the last term, and multiply the result by the number of terms, then divide by two. So in our example from before, the first term was 370 times 103. And then the last term was 370 times 1, right? Add the first term and the last term. Multiply the result by the number of terms, which was 103. And then divide the result by 2. This is exactly what we did. These are the steps that we ended up doing when you add, write them in order, write them backwards, add them up. These are the exact steps you end up doing. So just to summarize, this is what we did. So when you multiply this out, 370 times 103 is 381110 plus 370 times 1 is 370. Okay, so then continuing on here, add 370 and multiply by 103 and divide by 2 and you get 1,981,720. Same number we got by writing doing the trick of writing forwards and backwards. So you can do it either way. If you can, if you forget the formula, if you forget this little trick, just write it out forwards, write it out backwards, add the two equations together. Um, but there's also this little trick that just summarizes that procedure. Add the first term to the last term, multiply by the number of terms, and then divide by two. All right, so here's a, another example. This time you're going to do, try it on your own. That same nuclear reactor, storing 35 tons of waste and producing 5 tons per year, 
the town in which that reactor is located decides to charge a tax on the company that owns the reactor, and they're going to decide how much they charge based on how much waste it's storing. Okay, so they're going to charge $1,000 for each ton of waste that's being held in the storage tank. So assuming the tank isn't emptied, how much will the reactor pay the town over the next five years? How much, how much does it pay right now when there are 35 tons of waste? And then, and then five years in addition to that. Yeah. All right. So this nuclear reactor, it starts out with 35 tons of waste. And the town tax collector shows up, looks at their tank, says, OK, you have 35 tons of waste. We're going to charge you $1,000 per ton. So in year one, or year zero, right? First time the tax collector shows up, they charge $35,000. And then the next year, one year later, the tax collector shows up, looks at their tank, and says, how many gallons are going to be in there? 40. There's 40 gallons in the tank the next year. So they're going to get charged $40,000. The next year, $45,000, because the amount of waste in the tank goes up by five every year. And so then we're going to add 50000 for year three, 55000 for year four, oops, and 60000 for year five. So this is current year plus five more years worth of taxes. So I could, because the list is relatively short, just six numbers, right? I can type it into my calculator and add them up. So let's see, I could do 35,000, 35 plus 40, plus 45, plus 50, plus 55, plus 60, is 285,000. Two hundred eighty-five thousand. Just adding it, type it into my calculator and add it. The shortcut for the long list of numbers will also work, right? You add the first number in the list and the last number in the list. Thirty-five thousand plus sixty thousand. Multiply by the number of numbers in the list. How many terms are in my list that I'm adding together? Six and then divide by 2, 285,000. So add, add first and last, multiply by the number of numbers in the list, divide by 2. So I'll write it out. So we do 35,000 plus 60,000. Add the first number and the last number. Multiply that by the number of numbers in the list, which is 6 and then divide by 2, and you get the 285,000, which you can also get by just adding the numbers in the list. The shortcut is really for when you have to add, like, 20 numbers, right? When it's only 5 or 6, you can just add them up on your calculator. So there's a little bit of interpretation here. It's, it's not quite clear whether they want this 30 they want five or six years I don't I don't think it's quite clear the way I wrote the question um, so either interpretation like if this is on a test I would take either interpretation 225 or 285 yeah if I want to be clearer instead of saying starting this year I might have said like including this year as one of the five. All right, so now I have a little uh, activity for you to try where you apply all the things that we've talked about so far. <laughs> 